All right, everybody, we're going to give this a go, but I'm not going to lie to you. We're not, might not get through the whole chapter because I am tuckered. So, yeah. All right. Talking about communities and ecosystems, definitely give this a read if you want. Um, we're just going to dive right into it. I'm going to have people define the following terms. For instance, communities of living organisms plus their habitat. So kind of important. Uh, moving on down here, I'm going to want you to define ecosystems, respiration, photosynthesis, autotrophs, bioaccumulation, and biomagnification. They're going to come in later in this chapter, but big time importante, especially with food systems. Um, ecosystems can be different sizes, small or large. Um, you can have an ecosystem that's the size of like a puddle. And then you can have ecosystems that are the size of a city. Um, you can debate that, you know, because my wife and my niece from Puerto Rico were talking about the difference between urban versus rural. You know, is New London here in New England an urban setting? Depends on who you ask. Um, respiration and photosynthesis. Respiration isn't just like breathing. It's the breaking down of um, food to energy. So like when you consume food, you know, you eat French fries, for instance. Your body breaks down the starches. It also breaks down the fats too, but we don't go into that. Um, then you convert it towards energy. It can be aerobic or anaerobic with or without oxygen. Obviously, aerobic is with oxygen. Without oxygen is anaerobic. Um, you can tell which one is gives you more energy over long term. When you go for a long term run, are you breathing during it? You bet. When you do a big bench press or big activity and you're like that are you using are you really breathing for it not really so anaerobic gives you quite a bit of energy but over a short time span aerobic gives you more over time aerobic right here glucose plus oxygen equals energy water carbon dioxide so these are the waste materials so obviously <clears throat> when you're going when you're playing volleyball and you're breathing you're consuming glucose and oxygen to give and the result is it gives you energy it also gives you water and carbon dioxide which you breathe out most energy is released as heat that's why um <clears throat> if you get four dudes in a car you're probably going to be warm in there just because all everybody's producing heat um also too if you're freezing if you got a dog at the house if that dog jumps onto your bed it helps warm up the bed it's just body heat so um, whenever you have in, most energy is released as heat, that's going to increase entropy because it's just flat out energy loss. So <clears throat> keep that in mind. Photosynthesis. Let me see if we can move these things over to here. Like might help you out some. Maybe not, but what the heck, right? All right, photosynthesis. Green plants do this. Other Color plants might as well, if you've got like forsythias or something. Um, resp <clears throat> respiration is, it happens in the dark. Um, photosynthesis and respiration, it happens in the light. So during the day, you're utilizing photosynthesis. Sunlight's coming in, those chloroplasts in the um, loaded with chlorophyll or are doing their thing in the green leaves. Um, but at night, and they're also respiring, which is um, utilizing that energy that's stored, but also to <clears throat> um, the respiring in the dark as well. Uh, <clears throat> photosynthesis transforms light energy into chemical energy. So it's transfer of energy, basically. Um, leaves have chloroplast in them. Inside their load, those chloroplasts are loaded with chlorophyll. They combine water with carbon dioxide to make a glucose molecule. Glucose molecule are the building bricks in chemistry <clears throat> for a lot of your other molecules. Um, glucose stores energy as well. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I know my voice keeps going. Sorry, peeps. If you're listening to me, this has got to be brutal. My wife's making fun of me. <laughs> it's okay. All right. Um, So we talked about how glucose stores energy, but it's also the building block for other molecules. So if you add a nitrogen to it plus sulfur, 
It's where you're going to get the amino acids and then it builds up in your proteins. Um, amino acids are rather important. You can only get your body makes them except for a few essential amino acids, which you can only get from other food groups. If you add a phosphorus that you usually makes, you can make a fatty acid in lipoproteins, which are really important for your cell walls. So fats are actually a major part of your diet. You do need fats in your diet. It's just, you need good fats. Um, <clears throat> it's also, um, glucose is what makes biomass without it. You got no mass to no carbon, uh, photosynthesis is carbon dioxide plus water. And that's where you make the glucose in the oxygen. So when you've got sunlight coming on in for photosynthesis, your plants are taking in carbon dioxide, which is what you and me breathe out and, um, water. So they're taking that and they're taking water, combining it to make glucose. And they're also, um, the byproduct of that is oxygen as well. So plants do breathe out oxygen, which good reason to have plants inside your house. Um, you can add biomass during the day, but use it to stay alive at night. Compensation point is um, basically the dawn or in the evening. Um, dusk when a plant is doing neither of those. So when you've got, um, so during the, you know, obviously during the daytime photosynthesis is happening, you're storing glucose. At night, you're burning it. But during the dusk in the day, it's where it equals out, where you're not really putting any way into storage, but you're not burning any either. So, <clears throat> um, food chains and trophic levels, all energy comes from the sun. So solar energy is the start of every food chain. Keep that in mind because no food chain I've ever seen shows the sun, but it is there. Um, it's the start of all the food chains. So, um, define food chains for me and then draw a food chain. Trophic levels are levels where you're at in the food chain. So look, most of us, we're pretty on top of the food chain. <clears throat> we can knock back a bag of Doritos. We can knock back a bag of, I'm um, sorry, some chuletas, some pork chops. We can eat, you know, just about anything. So we're on the top of the food chain. Unfortunately, if you do go swimming and a shark, great white shark does say, hey, you look delicious. That means that you're not the very top of the food chain. So luckily sharks don't really pay attention to, you know, eat people too often. If they do, it's by mistake. Uh, producers are autotrophs and chemosynthetic organisms. Chemosynthetic organisms are weird. We're not going to get into them for this class but they're important to know that they're there. They basically don't live off like sunlight. They're down by the vents by, you know, where the ocean um, has these heat vents that come out and that's what they use to basically propel themselves through life. Um, consumers are the heterotrophs. They're your herbivores, carnivores, omnivores, detritivores, uh, decomposers as well. So the, your consumers are your, your producers are most of your plants. And your consumers are the things that are freeloaders and just steal them. Um, primary producer is can be like a grass. Primary consumer can be ants. Now, <clears throat> why? Because the ants eat the grass. And then guess what? The chickens eat the ants. And then us humans, we eat the chickens. And then once we die, the vultures eat us. And then you've whatever's left, you got bacteria that'll break us down. Ash to ash, dust to dust. Strangely enough, waste is a human concept. Nature wastes nothing, which is kind of creepy, but you can roll with it. Um, food webs. Real world, there's more webs than simple food chains. When you think about it like a food chain, let me get down the book. I kind of haven't been following along here. So this is a food chain right here. Pretty simple. You know, comes with a coloring book. It's so simple. Now, food web. Yeah, that's that like advanced stuff. That's not like that little, you know, kindergartner stuff down here. 
food webs look more like this. Um, why? Because they're more real world. Look, if you're looking right here, the hunting dog, yeah, it'll eat the Impala. But those things are fast. If you can't net knock back an Impala, hey, maybe you find a wildebeest that's, you know, a little old, a little long in the game. Time for it to go. Um, hey, but look, you can't bag yourself a wildebeest. You know what? You might just have to settle for a zebra, you know? Um, you know, so you, you got a pretty diverse food chain right there. Um, <clears throat> where are we at this? Because animals eat different species. Look, so you're never going to have a food chain where it's like, yep, nope, I found my thing. I'm, you know, a lion, I only eat giraffes. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. All right, draw food web uh, from page 70. Page 70 is this page right here. So you got to give this a read and then draw the food web from it. You also got to answer the questions on page 71, which is going to be right over here. So, <clears throat> you know, for drawing a food web from page 70, give this a read, give it your best shot. Now for these, what is the longest food chain uh, in this food web? Let's see what we got. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. Vegetation, herbivores, uh, insects, carnivorous insects, toads and lizards, foxes. Find one that's more than five for me. You know, probably that's out there, but... <coughs> Name two species that are found at two trophic levels. Oh boy. So let's see what we got here for this one. Um, here's a trophic level right here. So. Yep. Now I'm going to have to study a little bit harder. If all kestrels die, what might happen to voles and short-eared owls? Well, if these things died, there'd be a heck of a lot more voles. Because there's a heck of a lot more voles, you're going to have a heck of a lot more short-eared owls a few years after the, the, those kestrels disappeared. So, um, is there a great increase in the, if there is a great increase in the rabbit population, what happens to rabbit predators and vegetation predators? Vegetation. All right. If a pesticide is added to kill spiders, what may happen to the foxes? Ooh, very good. We're looking at that bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Um, so obviously, you know, with this one, if you kill off the spiders, there's not as many toads and lizards. So if there's not as many toads and lizards, the foxes don't, that's one of their food groups that's gone. So there's not going to be as many of them. So you kill off the spiders, you kill off foxes. Ecological pyramids down here. Ecological pyramids are graphical models of quantitative differences between amounts of living materials stored at each trophic level of a food chain. Hey, look, I just, that's straight from the book. Um, these are really good because it's easy to see energy transfers plus losses. So you can see right here. Grassland, producers, right here, grass, yeah, all right. Um, continue, I think. All right. Um, so grasslands here. First ones are the herbivores. You do lose some energy going from grass to herbivores, but you know then you lose more as you're going up. Primary carnivore, secondary carnivore by the top, you're a peacock, man. Um, you've lost quite a bit of energy, a lot of entropy there, so... Uh, it shows balance. So you do have, it shows your top carnivore. There's not a whole lot of them, you know, because you're feeding off what's below you. Um, shows balance as well. Also shows the pyramid of, um, I'm sorry. Uh, down here, we're going to go off a of pyramid of law of numbers. So 
This is the number of organisms at each trophic level at a moment, standing crop. So standing crop is basically that number of species in an area at a given moment. You know, um, number of organisms at each. So like looks like a horizontal bar graph to me. Um, advantage is it's simple overview plus shows a change in population. So you can see how it goes over time. Disadvantage doesn't show biomass. So like it doesn't show how big the animals are or how many of them there are. So, yeah. Um, actually it does show kind of like number of organisms but it doesn't show like their size really basically doesn't differentiate between young and the old so if you look down here these pairs uh let's go actually with let's go with these rabbits we don't know if the population is a young rabbit population or old or just in its prime years so also the numbers are too big for accuracy so yep um, peeps, we're going to let it go at that for the moment. I think I've given you enough to look up for in one class. And, uh, I've got my niece here and my wife. Here, I'll show you my wife. There we go. She's hiding. She's embarrassed. And my niece says she doesn't want to be in the camera. So, um, which is probably good because otherwise I'll end up in a TikTok with her or something. So can't have that. All right, peeps. Hope you're doing great. Thank you. Bye.